In this video I'm working back on the Intel MDS system. This is one of the processor boards and I showed this in the last video. I took out the DRAM, tested the DRAM and they were all working fine. Cleaned up the board. Uh, I have refitted the front panel, checked all the contacts, cleaned those. Uh, I showed you in a, a previous video making up this test jig. And what I want to do today is get this board powered up. I've done uh, quite a lot of inspection and it all looks fine. That's as far as I can go with just inspection. I've checked between the rails, there are no shorts. And so the next thing is to get this powered up. Normally I would take out all the large scale devices, but I believe this board's been powered up already. So I'm going to power this up with these devices in, but I will be leaving the DRAM out. I won't be connecting anything else. It won't run properly, but it should run up to a certain point. The processor should certainly uh, start running. And uh, the main thing I want to do in this video is uh, get this test jig hooked up to some power. Now, as I've previously stated with uh, boards that contain uh, DRAM, multi-supply DRAM that is, then it's very important that all three rails are connected and you don't run the board with just uh, one or two of the rails powered up. So I want to get all three um, connections made up to the power. I don't want to just plug this into the uh, MDS power supply because the current limit on that is extremely high and if there is something wrong with this it could destroy the board. But I do like to be very careful when I'm making up custom test jigs. Uh, obviously we haven't powered this up so far and I haven't yet made up the test jig and the connections. That's what I'll be doing in this video. In order to make sure I get it right and don't make any mistakes, I just want to carry out some basic tests to make sure that uh, I get the power connections correct. So I like to do this in two ways. I like to do some sanity checks on the board to make sure that what I'm looking at seems to make sense. And I also like to compare it directly against the schematic. And yes, for a change, I actually have the schematics for this uh, device. It's very rare I have schematics to work from, but I have a full set of schematics for these machines. And um, that should make life uh, a lot easier than the usual repairs that I do. Having said that, I want to make absolutely certain that this schematic is correct. I've got no reason to doubt it, um, but I'd just like to make absolutely certain that um, the schematics are correct before I start. It does say model MDS231 in the bottom right hand corner, so that seems to tie up with the machine. But we'll do some basic sanity checks and make sure what we're looking at is, um, is correct and it, it makes sense with what's connected on the board. So the board's plugged into the back plane, so we know that these connections, which are all power, should be going through to certain pins on the board. Um, one trap for young players as Dave would say here is um, there are two connections designated J12 and J13 you probably can't see that but that's what it actually does say on the back plane um, but notice that the seven pin connector the pins are designated in order and they're starting on the right hand side so pin one's on the right but if you look at the nine way connector you'll notice the pins are actually out of order it's nine one two three four eight six seven five for some bizarre reason, I'm not quite sure why they would have done that, but um, it's the sort of thing you need to watch out for, um, especially older schematics are not always quite as um, uh, well ordered as more modern schematics tend to be. So just bear this sort of thing in mind, always read the schematic very carefully to make sure that you're absolutely certain of what it is you're looking at. So to start with, we'll check all the grounds. So. Um, the first one is pin 1 on jumper 13, should be ground. So to test this we'll pick something on the board that we know should be connected to ground. I've got the meter set for continuity and it will buzz when we get a contact. So pin 1 should be ground, which it is. Pin 6 should be ground, which it is. And on the 7 way connector, again pin 1 should be ground which it is, pin 7, and again that's correct, and then pin 8 is designated as uh, minus, which I think is just um, the uh, return for the power supply. So all the grounds seem to be correct. The next one we'll look at is the plus 5 volt. So we'll connect to something we can be fairly certain is 5 volts, 
and then we're looking for pin 2 on this connector and pin 3 and we're also looking at pins 5 and 6 on this connector which are correct and just to be absolutely certain we'll try a few other points on the board just to make sure that it's not a, a weird chip or something we're looking at but these are all 7.4 series chips so we can be fairly certain we know what we're looking at okay we then want uh, plus 12 and the plus 12 is used for the uh, DRAM so if we grab the spec sheet for the uh, DRAM we can see that um, the plus 12 volt supply is VDD and that's pin 8 so pin 8 on the socket and this should take us through looking at the schematic to pin 4 which indeed it does and so the next one is we're looking now for the minus 5 volt supply for the DRAM and there is no minus um, 5 volt coming into the edge connector so the reason for this is the regulator is local that's this device here so we need to be looking for the negative supply that's going to be feeding that so if we connect to the pin on the backplane connector that we think will be feeding this and that goes to the input of the regulator and then we have ground which is correct and then the output pin should of course be the one that's going to the uh, DRAM and this is the uh, minus 5 volt supply which is VBB uh, which is shown as pin 1 so if we look at pin 1 on the DRAM then that should be coming to this pin which is correct so we can now be fairly certain that all this is actually correct and all the connections on the backplane power connectors are indeed going to parts of the board that make perfect sense with regards to the uh, schematic that we're looking at now in addition to this we have a second schematic which is for the uh, backplane edge connector so that's this big green connector and again if we look at the power on here we can see there are pin numbers that uh, designate which particular pins on that uh, edge connector are for uh, what uh, power rail so if we look at the plus 5 volt for example then pins 3 and 4 are plus 5 volt and if you recall pins 3 and 4 on here were also 5 volts so if we now connect from here we should get a direct connection to this which we do so we know that um, these are tying up the way they should what I'll do now is go through the rest and make sure that uh, each of the pins on here that is designated having specific uh, power um, connections is actually connected through to those power connections on the uh, power um, sockets if that all ties up then I can be fairly confident that if I tie power up in the way that it's designated on this schematic then it's not going to do any harm to the board and it will all be connected up the way it should be so I'll make up a, an adapter now we'll get it hooked up to one of the lab supplies I'll set the lab supply for the various voltages that we're looking for so that they match what's on the schematic we'll get this powered up and then we can start doing some uh, quick uh, tests to make sure the voltages are appearing on the board uh, where they should be and also we'll look at the current that's being drawn by each of the rails to make sure that makes sense with um, what we're expecting once we've done that we can start um, probing around the board see if it's running and although we don't need to at this point what I'll do then is hook up the logic analyzer so that we can start looking at some of the signals and because I've been asked to show more detail on using the logic analyzer um, I thought I'd take this opportunity to show how to set up the logic analyzer from scratch to do something like this so we'll start with um, a, a bare logic analyzer setup and then we'll start deciding what to connect it to how to connect it and how to configure the logic analyzer to start looking at the signals on this board we don't really need to at this point but it will certainly be interesting to do that and also it will be useful later on when we start actually looking for uh, potential faults on this board.
So after double checking all the connections and going through the schematic in detail to make sure that all the connections on the schematic uh, match up with what I'm seeing on the actual board, I've just put together a very quick um, hookup here to apply some power to the uh, back plane. I will be making up a full jig for this, but just to start with, I want to apply minimal power uh, just to the rails that I need. I don't need all the rails at this point, just the ones I've got here. So we'll give it a quick test to make sure that uh, I've got these right. I'll power these up. So I should have from ground on the right, I should have 5 volts, which I do, then 12 and minus 10, which are all correct. So I'll get the jig back, we'll get this plugged in and then we'll look at powering up the uh, board for the first time. Okay, so we are ready to power up the board for the first time. Um, I think this board's been run already, but I'm not absolutely sure. Um, but I'm treating it as if though it hasn't been run for a long time, so I'm going to be very careful in powering this up. I've removed all the large scale devices, and uh, what we'll do to start with is just power up the three rails. The DRAM is still removed, just to be on the safe side. And um, what I should find now is that all three rails come up to the voltage that they're set to and the current should be within acceptable limits. So if you're not familiar with working on old equipment like this, you may be surprised how much power they draw, especially on the 5 volt rail. So I've got the Rigel set to a current limit of 3.2 amps on the 5 volt rail. I expect it to draw maybe a couple of amps at the moment. Um, it won't be drawing full current because of the uh, missing devices. But as I start to refit these, you'll see the current draw go up and it will probably peak at uh, probably a little over 3 amps by the time we've got all the devices fitted. I've got the scope ready so we can check um, any activity on the board and I've got the test meter so we can check the rail voltages to make sure they're all correct before we start plugging in any more devices. So what I'm going to do now is start to uh, power this up, check the voltages, I'll then start refitting all the missing devices. Once they're all in place, if nothing uh, untoward has happened, we'll configure the logic analyzer for a very basic hookup for this, um, this board. And um, we'll see how we get on and if the board's running at all. So I'll power up the three rails. And the current we're getting on the minus 10 volt supply is just over a milliamp. It's not surprising, that's only really there to supply the DRAM, which is obviously not plugged in. Um, we've just got the uh, standby power of the regulator showing at the moment. The 12 volt rail is showing just under 50 milliamps, and the 5 volt is just over 2 amps, so that's pretty much what we would expect. The test meter is referenced to ground, so I've got that plugged into the common ground, and we'll now start measuring to see if we're getting the expected voltages uh, on the board. So we'll just pick some random devices and have a quick uh, poke around, so that's just under 5 volts. We will of course get some voltage drop in the uh, leads going to the board. Uh, that is the purpose of the sent returns that are on this connector that normally go back to the power supply. They correct for the voltage drop in the leads, uh, but because we're not using that then we are going to see a slightly low voltage. So that's looking fine, just under 5 volts. We'll check the other rails that uh, we're expecting to see on the uh, DRAM. So we've got ground, minus 5 volts, 12, and finally plus 5 volts. So that's again looking fine. All looking good so far. We won't get any activity of course because without the processor fitted uh, there'll be no clock. Uh, the clock circuit's actually built into the processor on this board, so although there's a crystal, there's no oscillator until we plug the processor in. So that's looking fine. Um, the processor, incidentally, if I haven't mentioned it, is uh, an Intel 8085. Uh, if we need to later on, we'll get the uh, Fluke uh, plugged in and um, step through the code, but for now we'll just do very basic testing. So next step is to start refitting the large scale devices and we'll keep an eye on the current as we fit each one and uh, see what happens. So at the moment 2.14 amps, I'll now start refitting the devices. <laughs> 
Okay, so got these two guys refitted, power back up, and we're now at just under 2.3 amps. Again, that's looking fine. Just quickly check the 5 volt supply. It's only really the 5 volt supply that's going to be affected much by this, and that's looking fine. So we'll now try refitting this guy. Power back up. Just over 2.3 amps, and again we'll check the supply, which is fine. Power up again. 2.4. Still fine. Now, obviously, if we get a sudden huge uh, spike in the supply current, then we know that uh, something's not right. We're just coming up towards 2.5 amps. Voltage is still fine. Current on the other rails hasn't gone up at all. We wouldn't expect it to. Most of these devices don't use those two rails. A little over 2.5 amps. Power's still fine. Two point six amps. Still fine. This is where we're probably going to start seeing uh, larger rises in uh, current. This is, I happen to know, a fairly um, a heavy user of power, so we'll probably see a bit of a step in uh, current here. Okay, 2.8 amps. Still reasonable. Just under 3 amps. Still fine. Okay, so that finally leaves the processor to fit. So we'll get this guy fitted and then we'll see if there's a, a clock being generated and see if there are any signals on the board. Okay, slightly over 3 amps. 4.8 volts and we'll check to see if we're getting a clock on the processor. Which we are, so that's looking uh, very promising. It's 4 MHz is showing, it's an 8 MHz crystal and the clock internally in this processor is divided by 2 so that's exactly what we would expect to see. Um, we'll come back to this in a minute but there's a bit of an odd uh, processor if you're not familiar with the 8085 in that it doesn't have separate address and uh, data bus pins on the processor it's got an internal latch for the data bus so it kind of shares eight of the address pins it's internally it's very similar to an 8080 but um, as far as the pinouts concerned because this processor is aimed more at a system integration it's got more uh, control pins and because of that it means there aren't enough uh, spare pins on the device for uh, dedicated data bus pins. So there's an internal latch, 8-bit latch, that is shared between the address and uh, data bus for 8 of the pins and it's always worth checking on a system like this what's going on on uh, those pins to make sure there's nothing weird going on and that's kind of a, as a first um, step to see whether or not the system is behaving itself. So just have a quick look at those and it actually looks fine. If you're familiar with looking at uh, signals on a processor you'll know what I mean if you see a signals being loaded or if there's any contention on the board at all and this looks absolutely fine. Okay so now that we know it's running or at least to a certain degree. It won't be running properly of course because there's no uh, DRAM fitted. So I'll leave it running for a while and at the same time I'll have a look at it through the thermal camera make sure nothing's overheating. I'll keep an eye on the currents uh, that are being drawn on each bus and if falls looking well in about 10-15 minutes then we can hook up the logic analyzer and um, have a look at some of the signals that are coming out of the processor. Okay, it's been running for a while. I've been keeping an eye on it with the thermal camera.
it's all settled down quite well there's nothing getting very hot it looks like there are sort of hot spots on the thermal camera but uh, as I've mentioned in previous videos it, it's a bit deceptive they're not uh, nearly as uh, hot as they look it's just because um, there's a, a limited uh, range of temperatures the camera's showing so it, it shows everything from uh, red to blue uh, but it's looking fine there's nothing getting hot the voltages and currents are still what they should be so the next thing is we'll hook up the logic analyzer so what I'm going to do here is fit a, a test clip to the processor. We will need to attach the analyzer to quite a few other signals when we start testing this uh, in earnest, but just for this video and we'll have a quick look at the processor and um, we'll see what's, uh, what's going on there and how to initially configure the analyzer to look at a board like this. So step one in getting the analyzer hooked up is of course to power off the board uh, and then we need to attach a test clip to the uh, processor or the device that we want to monitor. Many different sorts of test clips you can use but um, I tend to select one that's most appropriate for the uh, type of device whether I use uh, knife edge or uh, spoon ended uh, depends on uh, the condition that the, uh, the chips are in. So first thing of course, as I said, make sure it's powered off. Uh, attach the clip. And it is worth spending time to make sure it's properly attached. If you don't get it on properly, you can end up uh, with uh, poor signals or even damaging the board. And uh, you might find that it, uh, the signals you're seeing aren't what you expect simply because you're not making good contact with the pins on the device. So I've got that nice and secure. And so the next thing is to attach the uh, analyzer to it physically. So I normally start with uh, pod one. So the analyzer typically has one or more uh, of leads like this coming out. They're labeled uh, pod one, pod two, uh, etc., just so that um, you can identify them within the analyzer system itself. Normally you'd find the matching pod, uh, but it doesn't really matter as long as um, for the way I'm going to configure it, the only thing I need to make sure is whichever set of um, connectors I use, there is a, uh, a clock connection and a ground connection. So that then plugs in. Notice this says pod 3, it doesn't really matter as long as it has the, um, the connections that you want. Um, but you do need to make sure that uh, you know which pod uh, lead you're connecting to. Uh, normally what you do is attach this and tape it down. Uh, I won't do that here. But the way I'm going to configure this is to hook up the first pod to the address bus on the processor. So each of the pods has 16 pins. It's a 16-bit bus, so that makes life a lot easier. And what we'll do is look at the spec sheet and see which particular pins we need to connect the pod to. In theory, it doesn't matter which way you connect these, but in order to get sensible data on the analyzer, you'd need to attach the bus uh, pins to the correct pins on the pod. Otherwise, you'll find it very hard to interpret the data that you're seeing. So in other words, uh, connection zero needs to go to bit zero, connection one to bit one, etc. So looking at the first one, uh, as I said earlier, it's a bit of an odd processor in that it's got a, a common uh, eight pins for the first bits of the address bus and it shares those with the data bus. So we'll come back to that when we configure the analyzer but for now it means that we don't have a separate data bus to hook up. So we'll start with um, uh, data pin 0 or address pin 0 and that's pin 12 on the processor. Bear in mind the processor uh, pin 1 is this pin so it'd be 12 pin down. And whenever I fit the first one, just to be sure, count down to the end. Make sure we've got the right one. Uh, and then we just follow through and get the rest of them connected as they're shown on the data sheet. So that's the first seven, and then the next seven 
just continue on pin 21 and uh, count incrementally upwards. Okay, so that's all 16 bits of the address bus and in this case the eight data lines connected. I will also need to connect up the uh, clock line. Now I'll explain why we need the clock line when we look at the analyzer screen. We need the clock output pin. Uh, although there are two uh, pins for the clock input on this processor, these are pins one and two, X1 and X2, that's what the crystal connects to. So they um, just allow an external crystal to be connected and there's an internal oscillator. Um, but we need the clock out pin um, because we don't want to hook the analyzer to the crystal that could stop the crystal from oscillating uh, and also we want the actual system clock speed which is half of the crystal speed so that's pin 37 okay so initially that's all we need we will be connecting up other lines later on but just have a very quick look at the processor that's all we need to connect as far as signals are concerned. Uh, however, we do need to hook up the uh, ground lead. If we don't hook up the ground lead, then of course the analyzer won't be able to reference anything uh, to ground, in which case it's not going to give the uh, correct signals on the uh, analyzer inputs. So the pin we want to connect it to is the ground pin on the processor. Okay, so initially that's it. As I say, we will need uh, probably quite a few other connections and in fact we'll probably end up uh, maxing out the connections on the analyzer for this. It's got 128 uh, channels but we're probably going to need all of those for this project. Um, but for now we'll stick to just these 16 and uh, we'll have a look at the analyzer and see how to get it configured at least initially to look at this board. Okay so we'll set up the analyzer to do some basic testing of this processor. We will need to come back later and add far more lines to this configuration, but we'll start off just with a very basic configuration looking at just the address and data buses on this processor. And I'll go through the, the basic configuration from scratch, but as I say, we will have to come back later on and add far more uh, lines to this, and I suspect we will be maxing out this analyzer at some point in this project. But we'll start off and keep it fairly simple. So the first decision is the mode in which to run the analyzer. There are various modes and the two really we can select from here are timing and state. Uh, in timing mode it works very like an oscilloscope where it will take uh, readings of the inputs at regular intervals and those intervals are determined by the internal clock of the analyzer and that means that the data that's being captured is asynchronous to the system that you're monitoring. That is, the signals that are occurring on the board that you've got the analyzer connected to um, may change state out of sync with the clock in the analyzer. And what you normally do is have a, a clock rate much higher on the analyzer than the maximum clock rate you'd expect to see on the target board. However, for something like a microprocessor system, it's far more convenient and practical to use the clock on the uh, target board as the clock that drives the entire capture system. And that's what state mode is. If you select state mode, then you feed the analyzer with a clock from your target board, and then all the data is captured synchronously with the activities on the target board because the clock from the target board is what's driving, driving the acquisition on the analyzer. That does of course mean that you need a clock fed from the target board and that is why we hooked up the uh, clock input to the analyzer. Uh, without that clock input, if you select state mode, you'll get an error when you try and capture data because there's nothing um, driving the acquisition for the analyzer. So once you've selected the mode that you want to run the analyzer in, you just decide which pods you want to assign to the virtual machine. 
So in this particular analyzer you have two virtual machines within the hardware and those two virtual machines act very like completely separate logic analyzers and you decide how you want each one uh, configured and it means you can have two completely separate configurations within the one physical machine and all you do is decide which of the uh, physical pods you want assigned to which of those two virtual machines. Uh, in this particular setup at the moment we just have the first four pods assigned to our current active uh, analyzer. I'll leave it like that for now, we'll probably need to come back later and uh, assign the unused pods but if you recall at the moment we're only using the 16 bits on uh, the first pod. Also notice at the end we've got these letters J, K, L and M. Uh, they are the clock inputs on the uh, pod. So if you recall we connected the clock and in pod 1 that clock is referred to as the J clock and that's what we'll need to look at next. So once we've uh, carried out the basic configuration then we'll go through to format and in format one of the first decisions is which clock you want to use for the analyzer. This only of course applies to state mode when you're using it as a state machine um, but you select and then you decide which clock you want to assign. You can of course use multiple clocks and then you can decide to turn that particular input off completely and ignore it or have the analyzer capture data on the falling edge or the rising edge or both edges of the clock. To start with I recommend using both edges unless you're absolutely certain um, that updates to the system that you're interested in will only occur on a rising or falling edge. You will tend to capture more data using both edges uh, but whether that's what you want depends on what you're trying to look at on the system. But as I say I normally start off with of both edges so it captures data on the falling edge and also captures data on the rising edge of the master clock. And the master clock in this case if you recall is connected to the clock output of the processor. Okay so we've got that uh, configured. The next thing is to decide uh, which inputs you want to configure and how. So if you come down to pods you can scroll across and you notice here you were getting pods a4, A3, A2 and A1 and this just shows you the pods that you currently have assigned to this virtual machine. Uh, you could have up to 8 on this particular analyzer if you recall there were 4 unassigned pods um, but we are connected only to pod A1 at the moment. So we then come down to labels and down the left hand side you can see all the default names for the labels starting at bus 1 going through bus 2, 3 etc and what you do is you assign a name to that particular label and that label will then be assigned to the set of inputs that you define. So in this case we'll start off with the address bus so we'll modify the label and we'll call it uh, ADDR and when we give it a name, modify the name, notice it's now turned on uh, these boxes each one of the dots represents one of the inputs and if you recall we're connected to pod A1 and what you can do is just select it, scroll through to whichever input you want to make active, select it and once you complete anything that's showing a star is an active input for that label so that as it's configured here uh, only this particular bit which is bit 12 uh, would be an active input for that label but of course we want all 16 so I'll enable all 16 so now all 16 inputs on pod 1 are uh, assigned the label address so in other words any time we refer to the uh, address label within the analyzer from now on it's talking about these 16 inputs now if this was something like a Z80 the next thing you would do is assign the data bus so again you give it a name give it anything you want so we'll call it data and notice it's now turned on a second group of uh, inputs 
as I say if it was a Z80 it would now go to the second pod and we'd do something like that and we'd connect the eight lines the first eight lines on the second pod to the data bus we could do that on this processor but if you remember looking at the spec sheet then the first eight address lines are shared with the um, 8-bit data bus so rather than hooking up a second set of leads to these pins what we can do instead is just create a new label that is talking about those same eight inputs so I'll turn these back off we don't need to do that so on this particular processor what we can do instead is just assign a label to the bottom eight uh, inputs of pod A1 which are connected to the data bus. The fact that they're shared here doesn't matter it means we can refer to the bottom eight bits using the label data and all 16 bits using the label address. Once we have all the bits configured the way that we want so if this was a, a full setup we'd now go on and start assigning um, other bits, other inputs as single bits for uh, other uh, purposes so reset so uh, that sort of thing and what I would do is uh, I will just do one more so let's say we wanted to uh, use the reset input of the uh, processor then again what we would do is modify label and we'll give it a name we'll call it RST and let's assign that to bit 0 of pod 2. So what you would now do is connect the 0 input of pod 2 to the reset line and that would then be available throughout the uh, rest of the uh, setup for this analyzer. Next thing you do is go through to waveform and decide which particular inputs we want displayed at the same time. So we select insert and we'll start with the address bus we want to display it as a bus rather than individual lines so we don't want 16 lines showing for the address bus we just want uh, a single line that will give us the value on the address bus uh, we'll give it its own colour so we'll colour that blue and then we also want to insert the data bus again as a bus value uh, again we'll give it its own colour we'll make that green and then finally we want to insert the reset line and that's just a bit, single bit that we want to look at and we'll give that again its own colour and we'll make that yellow. Okay so what I'm going to do now is actually connect bit 0 of the second pod to the reset line on the processor. So you won't be able to see me doing that but all I'm doing is connecting the zero bit and that needs to be connected to pin 36 on the processor so I'm just going to connect this to pin 36 so you can't see uh, what I'm doing here but I've now connected the reset input which is a bit zero on pod 2 to pin 36 on the processor so now that we've done this uh, we can start capturing data before I start using a configuration I normally create a new directory for the project and save the configuration to that directory on the hard disk. It just means I can very easily come back and uh, reload it if I need to, if I want to come back and start work on the project again without having to go through and reload everything. So we'll just um, save this project to hard disk. So we select system I want to create a new directory so we come down select make directory we give the directory a name so we'll call this uh, mds231 it will reread the contents of the root and notice now we have a new directory called mds231 and the next thing we want to do is to change to that directory. Uh, notice it's empty, we haven't saved the configuration yet, so we'll go back up, go to store, 
give the configuration a name. Again, I'll call it MDS231. Select Execute. And it will now save this configuration as a set of three files. And so we now have this configuration saved to the analyzer hard disk. You can configure it to reload this uh, particular configuration automatically each time you start the analyzer. So if you're doing a long-term project, you might want to uh, reload this project each time you boot up the analyzer. We'll leave it as it is for now. We might come back and do that another time. Uh, but the final step before we can start capturing data is to assign a trigger. So to do that, we come to the trigger configuration and we now need to define the trigger parameters and essentially the trigger is just uh, defining what state all the inputs need to be before the analyzer will start to capture data. The triggers can get very complex, we'll stick to a very simple one at the moment and we're going to just say we're going to use trigger A which is uh, a configuration so each of the uh, trigger configurations is given uh, a name uh, in this case we're going to use the configuration A and we will trigger when that occurs one time. So what we will do is we'll use the reset input and it's a reset low which means the processor will start to run when that line goes high and that's the point we're going to start capturing data for this particular test. So we don't care what the address is so we'll leave that set to don't care which is all X's we don't care what the data is, so again XX, uh, but we want the reset line uh, set to a 1, meaning that when the reset line is a 1, we will start to capture data. Okay, and uh, that's it. If we now want to save this configuration, so let's say we've made some changes and we want to save the new configuration, then all we do is we go back to system, S store is still selected, press select, continue and done and it will save this new configuration and as I say it saves you a lot of time when you come back to reopen the project we can now go to waveform um, we can hit run on the analyzer and it's now waiting for the uh, inputs that we've defined for the trigger Notice it's saying slow or missing clock input and that's because the board is powered off so there is no clock. What I'm going to do is power it up, which I have done, and notice now that what we're getting is a value of zeros, which is the reset vector for the uh, processor. And it's not really going to do anything because there is no um, DRAM fitted. So this is now going to just sit here idling away. You can see the reset line has gone low again. So Watchdog is just going to keep resetting the uh, processor until something happens. In this case, it never will. The next step, of course, is to uh, put the DRAM back in, get that tested, and then we can start looking at capturing some actual data. But at the moment we have it set up to capture data on the address and data buses and um, in the next video we'll look at getting the DRAM refitted and see if we can get any uh, real activity on this board.